All right. All right, good morning and good evening to those joining um, the session. This is the Trusted Execution Environment and Provisioning Working Group Virtual Interim. Um, with you, we've got the two chairs, Sidhu and myself. The note well, because it is an ITF virtual interim, still stands. Um, hopefully, you're aware of the rules. And um, I just wanted to do a quick agenda bash. Um, as I don't see Hannes, I guess we won't have any updates as to the hackathon that's coming up in a week or so. Um, the only thing we have for the agenda today is the updates. There's been a lot of activity to the architecture document. And David, I put you in um, as the, the main presenter. So yep. um, anybody, yep, is that all right? So if I could ask help, we need at least one note taker. I've posted the etherpad in here. Can I have it volunteer, please, so that we can start? Can't really start the session, guys, unless I have one person helping take notes. I'm going to move vote Michael. I'll go find the ether pad here in just a second. All right. Thanks, Michael. All right, um, Dave. Uh, on the uh, agenda bashing, I do have one other uh, tiny item, which is uh, no no slide, just the status of the uh, um, TEEP over HTTP transport specification. Okay. I folded that in in the architecture. Do you want me to call it out explicitly? Uh, it, it, yes, and I just want like two minutes verbal. Okay. Okay. There you go. So, and that will replace, because I do not see Hannes on. So, um, well, you can move him to the end just in case he shows up during or something. Good point. All right. How's that? All right, going once, going twice. Dave, you want to take the ball? Uh, momentarily, let me cover point three to, uh, verbally. So the, Sorry. Yeah. Um, there's <laughs> a, a technical issue or two that overlaps with the uh, architecture uh, one. So that's why we rolled that one into the architecture document. But the status that I wanted to give is the uh, at last IETF 106, um, we had some uh, discussion uh, of what direction we should go with respect to supporting the old OTRP stuff. And we gave direction to the editor and said, well, um, you know, once this is done in the draft, then we would be ready to start working group last call. So I just wanted to report that I did that. And about an hour ago or whatever, I posted that version of the draft. It's not much to change. And so it's not significant. Um, because I just basically removed some information and did a couple minor corrections. And so my belief is that unless there are things that come up on the architecture that do affect the you know, TEEP over HTTP document, um, then it would be ready for working group last call, which is what we said at IETF 106, that we would start it after that. And so as we go through the architecture and we hit the one or two items, then the question we should keep in mind is, is this anything that requires an update to the document or not? And if not, then I think after this interim, then we might be, then at least my opinion is we would be ready to start working your last call. Okay, sounds good. So let's, let's revisit that when you go through the issues in the architecture. Okay. Sounds good. Great. And, uh, let's see if I can figure out how do I do here. Well, I can give it to you. Uh, I, 
Okay, there we go. Oh, you took it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Tell me when you can see my slides. Yes. Okay, great. And so now I cannot see the chat room or whatever. And so if you need to anything in chat that I should see, please interrupt me. <clears throat> All right. So uh, this is draft uh, architecture dash 06 that uh, Ming and I have been working on last week. Um, here is the timeline. Uh, so IETF 106, we had a discussion. We then posted draft 05 uh, based on the discussion IETF 106. That's what went through working group last call, which lasted for about four weeks, completing near the end of January. After the working group last call completed, we had a bunch of issues that we've been working on, and then we just posted draft 06 on Saturday, and that brings us to today. And so our goal is to go over what we did and see if there's any additional changes, um, because we still have time to post another version before the next ID cut off, and so we will do that. That's where we're at. Uh, we've addressed all of the issues we think raised in working group last call, except for maybe one or two that we'll start with here. So um, during working group last call, there was 19 issues filed in GitHub. Some of those were, uh, were opened by the person who did the review. If they were only posted to the list, then uh, Ming went and uh, added those issues into GitHub. So we think all the points that were raised are covering GitHub. Let us know if we missed anything. Um, of those 19, 17 of those are addressed in draft 06, uh, plus some additional minor editorial nits that weren't worth filing GitHub issues for. And so I'm going to walk through those, starting from the ones that were uh, not addressed, and then ending with the things that are kind of you know trivial or whatever. So if we have uh, time, then we'll get to the trivial ones. If we don't have time, then gosh, we'll skip the trivial ones because it's not necessary to, to go over them. So. Um, all right, so let me start with the two issues that are not done in draft 06 because we wanted more uh, either guidance of the editors, didn't, at least Ming and I didn't know what to do. So here we go. Here's the first one. Uh, so this is one that was actually filed, I don't know, like in December or something. And I think it was a uh, harness that opened it. And this has to do with um, the discussion around personalization data. And so there was some discussion in the GitHub issue itself that was largely between Ming and Hannes, neither of whom are on the call right now. Um, but I know what both of them think, but I don't know what the rest of the working group thinks. And so the question that Hannes raised was, does all personalization data require confidentiality, or can there be some personalization data that only needs integrity, right? And so you'll see the current text, which was what was in the document that went into working group last call, and even the one before that, it, it talked about personalization data must be encrypted, and other than that, T places no limitations or requirements of personalization data. So it meant that everything, there was only two categories of stuff. There was things that were, uh, could be sent to like every device that's out there and were not considered part of personalization data and things that were specific to individual devices that didn't go everywhere, it went to specific devices and those got encrypted with that device's T so that only that device could decrypt it. That was what personalization data was. And so Hana said, well, you actually need to encrypt everything, or could you have stuff that's device specific that actually doesn't need to be encrypted? In other words, is that must, really a must? And so Hannes and this PR suggested text, the personalization data may need to be encrypted, and deleting the other uh, phrase in, in bold is there. So in other words, he, repl he proposed replacing the above with the below. Um, and so then this uh, short discussion ensued between Ming, Hannes, and, and uh, me, um, trying to debate as to whether this was a must or a, you know, should or, you know, a conditional must, right? And so uh, I think, uh, I don't feel strongly either way. Ming thinks that the top one is correct and Hannes suggests that the bottom one is correct and we would like more discussion among the working group. So Dave, I'm trying to figure out which top, where it says the current text? Right. So Ming believes that the current text is correct. Hana suggests that the bottom text is better. And I don't have any strong preference either way. So Dave, this is Russ. Can I ask a question? Okay. Do we believe there will always be personalization data? In other words, 
Um, if the an implementation is required to do to support encryption because there is routinely personalization data, then it kind of the top encourages that approach. The bottom leads you to the place, well, hey, maybe I don't need to implement that uh, because that's not the normal case. Okay, and that's a great question. Do we have a feel for that? Um, I would say that was briefly discussed between Ming Hannes and I, and so I would say that between the three of us, um, then I suspect the that all three of us would say that it is not necessarily the case that there will always be personalization data for a specific device, right? meaning there may be specific cases where a particular device does not need personalization data. That said, even Hannes, when suggesting the bottom one, Hannes believes that it should be mandatory to support encryption, although that does seem like it might not be, at least he said that in the comments. Um, but if you have a device that is incapable of getting personalization data, then that would be incompatible with saying, well, why would I need to support encryption then? This is Kathleen. I have a question. And maybe I missed this, so I apologize if I missed it. Um, with the personalization data, are you considering things like the um, standardized random format for MAC addresses because they're unique, but um, following the IEEE work for randomization so that no one vendor had a unique randomization pattern. Um, you know, is that considered in scope of this or out of scope? Because that might be guiding. About, I don't know enough about that to have an opinion other than uh, the so, personalization data here is uh, format agnostic, meaning it's just opaque. Yeah, so I, I think then maybe Hannes's may be more appropriate if there's some language to provide examples. Um, what I triple E did, and um, we can provide information. Um, Juan, I believe, Carlos. Um, yep. So essentially, they worked across vendors uh, because everyone was moving towards MAC addresses becoming randomized. But you could identify which vendor's randomization pattern was in use um, when they all had their own. So IEEE has a standard, which is, I believe, pretty well adopted now, because this is when, when I was in AD, and we had the meetings between the IEEE and IESG. So that's more than a year and a half ago. Um, so if everyone's using those, you know, could that be an exception to this? Because it does uniquely identify a device potentially, right? The the identifier, and that could be device personalization data. But maybe that's okay to not have uh, to only have integrity protection in some cases. So this is Dave Wheeler. the The discussions that I've had with Ming on on this topic were primarily. Um, service provider type information that's coming ah. down with the application. Ah. So that might be a uh, username, password, email, uh, registered email address. Um, it could be a signing key that's associated with the application that's now been registered with the service provider. So it's Great. typically it personalization information very specific to the application being loaded. And I don't think it would be MAC addresses, which would be more system oriented. Okay, so perhaps that's the difference in language proposed from each person, and maybe clarifying that would be the way to gain consensus. This is Hank. Um, I like the idea of examples because I cannot think of an example where you have personalized data that you do not want to encrypt. That an example that I just don't know. So Hank, Hank, so what I described, some people would consider personalization data, even though it's a randomized MAC address for a device. And the reason is that you can pattern what that device does and track the behavior of the person with that device, right? But some people might not consider that personalization data because it doesn't fit into the bucket that Dave just described. It's not an email address, a password, or an account. Yeah, this is all, Kathleen, just to be clear, this is all information that is sent to the device, not from the device. And so if you're talking about a randomized MAC address being sent to the device as opposed to from the device, then that could be personalization data. 
Okay, but if we just made the text from the, or, or added to the current test text to explain further, and, and maybe it's in other text around it, but I'm sorry, I don't see it in the slide. Maybe that's a way to get beyond this particular one. Right, just to specify that more again, clearly. Yeah, but again, I, I don't even see a use case. So, so I, I think if you can tell me a use case where personalized data does not need to be encrypted if it's sent to the device. Right. Hank, so, here, Hank, here's I a, think you could here's one up. of the here's one of the things we discuss where uh, you get personalization data that doesn't need to be encrypted. Um, okay. Uh, an example would be uh, a list of uh, server addresses to, um, to contact the service provider um, with uh, times of operation or, or things like that. They, it would be personalizing the application, but it wouldn't be specific to one specific instance. It would be more of uh, a service provider general um, type of information that would normally change perhaps o over time. So um, it, it, you almost might say it's configuration data. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, I think yeah, just okay. adding that level of specificity will get you out of arguments in last call and in the IESG and after the document's published. I think Ming isn't here unless he, unless you guys tell me he just joined, uh, but I think Ming would say something very similar to what he said. Um, and so I'm going to try to channel uh, Ming here. Um, the personalization data is meant to be specific to a device. And so how do you know that uh, it gets to that device and not something else? Well, one of the mitigations, or one of the layers of the uh, security there is to say, well, if it's encrypted by that, uh, by that device's key, then you know that it's going to that device and not some other device. And so you have a very strong guarantee that you're configuring the correct device with it. And it's not, you know, you'll have some man in the middle redirecting it or something like that. There's other ways to solve that potentially, but this is a strong way to do that. Even if you don't, even if you don't need confidentiality, you're using it to verify that it's going to the correct device. So, Dave, maybe the way to skin this is to say implementations must support encryption to allow for the loading of personalization data that is sensitive. Well, yeah. Uh, Yes, that would be consistent with uh, Hannes's suggestion, which did not, which we didn't do any text changes for, right? But uh, Hannes did suggest that. Um, even though he only sent the specific text that's quoted at the bottom, he said that in his comment that we should probably also add a sentence such and such, like you just said. And so I still don't know whether it's a must or a uh, conditional must. Yeah, any data which is must support is what yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with Russ. It sounds like the a implementation. Month. Well, Russ, it's for the, I wrote it's for the Russ's person in, in the, the, the person configuring, right? So if the implementation supports, then from the IETF perspective, I, I, I think you'll be pretty good. Russ's Russ text in the, in the ether pad, if that's helpful. Okay. Um, I was going to ask uh, Russ, because uh, if Hannes is here, um, I would ask him. Um, if it is mandatory to support, is that it's the same thing as saying implementations uh, m must be capable of receiving personalization data, or is that a different statement that is not implied? No, it must be capable of handling encrypted personalization data. So it's a must, it's not conditional. Okay, then, uh, all right, so just to repeat back what I think you said, that uh, personalization must, I was just going to split into three pieces, all of which are true, and that the, the wording can be more concise than this. But in that proposal, a uh, device must be able to support personalization data, it must be able to support encryption, and it must be able to support encrypted personalization data. All three of those sentences are true. Yes, that's my proposal. Okay. Okay. So, uh, in that proposal, I think the first sentence of the current text is still true, meaning your truth in the bottom. The uh, bolded text, the other than this requirement, is no longer true because that gets replaced with uh, you must be able to support personalization data or something like that. All right, 
So, uh, Michael, can you read me if you have a uh, wording on the etherpad that you think captures this? Do you have something? Um, well, I didn't get your three sentences, unfortunately. Um, I got Russ's statement, and I think I changed the word slightly, which was implementations must support encryption to allow for loading of sensitive personal data. Okay. Uh, but I, I may have swapped the word in there for what you said. But no, I think that's close enough. I, I just don't know what the other two sentences are because they went by quickly and I was typing. Uh, that's okay. don't know either. As an editor, if this is the consensus of the working group, I know how to do text to do this. I think there's enough and that you've captured enough to be able to trigger that discussion. So um, anybody else want to weigh in? Because otherwise that sounds like what I'm hearing is as the direction of the editors so far. Sans, uh, Hannes' uh, comments on this would have been helped, I guess. Uh, this sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, unless Hannes joins the call or argues otherwise, then I think we can go on to the next issue. Okay. Yeah, message, right? What was that, Hank? I, I shot him a text message because I'm surprised he's not here. So, uh... Okay, great, thanks. All right, so that's one of the two issues that was not done. This is the other one that we didn't do anything about, and so I copied the complete uh, text of the uh, issue onto the screen now because this is all the information that we have. Uh, you can see the title. Filer, and this one is about stuff that I am certainly not qualified to answer here. EUICC should prove useful to provide embedded designs with IoT device services management as long as the MCU can mutually authenticate with the EUICC. Where does T fit into this picture? Um, and so when I read this, not knowing anything about the technical details of EUICC, I wonder if this is more like a question to the mailing list for somebody to answer than it is for a request for the architecture document to be discussing EUICC. But I wanted to throw this out to see if somebody more experienced, uh, more knowledgeable can help me uh, figure out what the right thing to do is here. Is there anybody else that actually understands the question? Is, isn't this related to whether the uh, device can uh, has a, um... A uh, smart card personalized for the EUICC. So then, th this would be a hardware-specific uh, solution that that isn't generally applicable. I don't think because that authentication would have to go into the TEE um, to be secure. And so then, you're talking about a very specific hardware implementation. Yeah. I'm not as familiar with EUICC, but to me, it feels like that's more of the credential. Do you know, Dave Wheeler? Um, I think it would be would... used for authentication, right, uh, of the right. device to a service provider or uh, the TAM. It, it's part of the eSIM spec, if I remember right. Yeah. But... So, so it only applies yeah. in cell-connected stuff. But I guess the question that I'm trying to go to is, this is more the question of the credential that gets used? So, as an editor, the main question that I have for the working group is the bottom question on this slide, which is, would it be sufficient to just have someone answer on the list, or is there anybody in the working group that believes that some change to the architecture document itself is needed? Um, in other words, can we assign it to somebody else other than Ming or me? Or is it something that we need to work on uh, drafting text for? This is Dave Wheeler. I'll, I'll make some comments on the list and then um, and attempt to close it on the list. If we need to do some text, I'll, um, I'll sounds, see what the list says. Sounds great. So we can assign this issue to you and hopefully it doesn't have any impact on the draft then is what I'm hearing. Yep. Okay. Excellent. All right. Any other comments on that one before we move on? Okay. Uh, so the next section are things that we think are addressed, and I've tried to front load the ones that um, uh, I wanted to 
consensus because they're not just editorial. Okay, and so there may be discussion of some of these, which is what we want. So that's the question mark on there. Are they addressed? Okay. So here's the first one. Uh, this one was a contradiction about whether a device must have a rich execution environment to use TEEP or not. So the issue was uh, there was text about the TEEP agent that implied that there must be a TEEP broker. The text about the TEEP broker says that the TEEP broker runs in a rich execution environment. And the introduction talked about there being TEEs and an REE if present. And so in other words, the introduction covered the case where like the entire microcontroller is just a TE and there's no REE. But then all the text around TEEP agent and you know, TEEP protocol implied that there had to be an REE and that was the contradiction. And so the question was and that this issue is about is can you have a TEEP agent and the TEEP over HTTP transport? They're both just in a device like an MCU that's entirely a TEE. Um, we did some changes for which the uh, which would be that the for if the answer is yes, then the draft 06 was updated accordingly, assuming that the answer should be yes, which is what the introduction implied. And so the actions that we did was we updated the text about the TEEP agent not imply that there has to be a TEEP broker. There's always an TEEP over HTTP transport, right? But it didn't imply that there must be a TEEP broker, just the word typically is used in at least two or three places. Uh, there was then a follow-on PR that did a couple more places and it has a clear wording and so it added this sentence explicitly. In devices with no TEE, the TEEP broker would be absent and instead the TEEP protocol transport would be implemented inside the TEE itself, right? Um, we didn't do a picture, it just says, this is after the discussion of the picture, the picture says typically, and then the sentence is there to just say, hey, uh, you know, it, it, the, the T broker might be absent, in which case the lines kind of just kind of go straight through. So this is, I wanted to confirm that people think we did the right thing in going in this direction. Are there any objections to the approach that says, yep, this sounds like the right direction, I'll look at the words just to verify. If there's no discussion, I'm going to go on hoping that we did the right thing, uh, because I'm still going to propose at the end that um, there's enough changes, enough issues that um, I think we're going to we should go through another uh, working group last call, and there is time to do that, and so we can still you know have people verify stuff when when doing that. But I think the editors think that we did went in the right direction, and as long as there's no objection, then I'm going to keep going. Okay. Next uh, item, somebody confirm that you can still hear me? That's quiet. Yep, we can hear you. Yep. All right, thanks. Okay, uh, next section was uh, another place where text in one section apparently contradicted another section. This had to do with the case where you have multiple TEEs in the same device. Right? And so if you have multiple TEEs in a device, um, and we even have you know a picture that uh, Dave Wheeler put in a while back that, that actually shows this, um, when you have multiple TEs in a device, then there could be one common TEEP broker that talks to multiple TEs, or there could be a TEEP broker per TEE or anywhere in between. That's, that's what the, it, the draft 06 is now consistent in basically saying that. The it, issue before was that one section implied that there was always one common and one implied that there was always one per TEE, and those were different answers. And so now we just updated them to be consistent to say that both are possible. Um, all right, the, uh, there was a pull request that did this and in some of the comments on the pull request, so of course the, the process that we've been following is at least two editors uh, agree on the pull request before we merge the pull request. And so that's why we often see these uh, comments between the editors and anybody else is welcome to. Um, and so in those comments, on the text here, there was also some discussion of exactly how the TAM selection is done. Uh, and it was who does the TAM selection and so on, which was not directly about this, that was more about the relationship to the TEEP over HTTP transport spec. So I guess Ming is still not on the call, right? Because he was the one that raised this comment. And uh, I just wanted to confirm with everybody else that we're still following what we did at I, what we talked about at ITF 106. So what we talked about at ITF 106, um, and the, maybe before that too, but the TEEP over HTTP transport set spec says that the selection of which TAM to communicate with, okay, this is the quote from L6, not the quote from the transport spec. 
the selection of which TAM to communicate with might be made with or without input from an untrusted application, but it's ultimately to the decision of a TEEP agent. Hi, David. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, right here. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, sorry, I was select. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks for joining. Oh, um, sorry, I'm late. Yeah. Yeah. So what the transport spec talks about is, is that uh, an untrusted application or it's manifest, right, can provide input. Uh, so let's say you have an untrusted application that depends on a particular TA. Right, so the untrusted applications at manifest can say, I have, a I have this particular dependency, and here's a URL that I that's in the manifest for the TAM for which that TA from which that TA can be determined. Right? So the application or the app installer can look at that to say, oh, I need to disinstall some dependencies, and so I have this TAM URI. And what happens in the transport spec is that TAM URI uh, and the T and the TA identifier, you know, the GUID or whatever, are passed into the TEEP agent to say, hey, there's a request to install this TA, and here's a TAM URI as a hint. Right? The TEEP agent looks at that and says, oh, this is already installed, there's nothing to do. Or it says it's not installed, and oh, here's a hint at the TAM URI, but I might have a better idea. Maybe my TE is managed by a particular device administrator, not the one, not, not and so it needs a different TAM than say the one that the TA, that the untrusted application developer had. And so it can override that TAM with a TAM that it trusts perhaps more um, or instead. And so it can use that instead. Or it could just use whatever was passed in to say, okay, sure, I'll go off and see if I can authenticate with that one and if I choose to trust them. And so that's what it means by ultimately the decision of the TEEP agent where whatever comes from the trusted application, untrusted application is just a hint. I just wanted to confirm, so this has been merged and it's in 06, and wanted to confirm that nobody objects to uh, the, the discussion of what I've summarized. Because like I said, this was discussed at uh, in the transport spec discussion at IETF 106 and before. Any questions or comments on this issue? Okay. Uh, so I don't remember if this is, so th this is slide one of two, so. Um, okay, I guess I've been talking about stuff that's on this slide, so let me just uh, briefly go through this one since I've now said pretty much everything that's on the slide, right? Um, so you can see uh, this is the comment in the middle of the discussion we were having on the GitHub issue. And uh, the current transport spec, I was just summarizing what it says. Those are the three bullets at the bottom which says what the transport spec says. So I'll leave this one up there just for a second here, but it doesn't say anything that I would already say. If I don't hear any comments, I'm going to move on to the next one and assume that there's that we're on the right track and that there's no necessarily no need for a change to the transport spec. I'm, I think I'm not sure what the action to record on this issue is. Uh, unless there's any objections, the action is that the issue is uh, closed, which is I think T already did, um, and that there is no action necessary on the transport spec. So basically, there's no action items, right? So, yeah, this is me. I, I just trying to say was um, still, uh, I raised this, uh, this comment here was that uh, it, tip broker may initiate a call to time first, right? Not always from tip agent, but as I so said, you, you said the first one is always from tip agent. The tip agent may not uh, know the time yet, right? So, we get time certificate, it, if time now sends something, tip agent doesn't know it should trust it yet. Um, so the other ways I thought it was, uh, you may not decide that or whether you sign or not, whether do you release your signing key or not, not signing key, signing certificate. So this is about who you open the HTTP right. connection to. Right. The, and so the TEEP agent is the one that selects that. And so it doesn't, um, um, have the TAM, it may or may not have the TAMs uh, search that time because that's what that's what it gets back inside that connection, right? But it still does the selection of which URI to use and says, hey, TEEP broker, please uh, connect to the following URI. Now, of course, assuming these are all HTTPS URIs, right, then implicitly the HTTP stack is going to do some uh, authentication there, right? Right, I remember with the first one. Okay, let's uh, let's clarify here a little bit. Okay, 
So TV broker pass to TV agent. You say, okay, option is overrided. Say, okay, let's say it's a done not overrided. It passed through, it's fine. And then before then, TV broker to connect to time. In this case, the TV agent, the TV agent constructs a request message or not. In this case, no, because when it pass through, it done it doesn't know what to do. And then it does not generate request. It will be just a contact connection from TV broker. That's what you are suggesting here. Cor correct. The thing that happens is an HTTP request. It's not a TIP request. So you make this a round trip. Just say when TIP broker always contact TIP agent before it costs the time. TIP agent time. make a, a choice there. Yes. This is addition, right? This additional from the original uh, flow. Okay. Uh, I see what I'm saying. This is no different from what the transport spec has always said. Okay, in that case, okay. Um, yeah, okay, let, let's move on. Let's I'll leave this for now and think about it because this is what. I don't you remember the uh, HTTP spec uh, that had the uh, the line diagram with the, uh, you know, the arrows going back and forth. I, I'm just explaining what was on uh, the one with the arrows. And all we've done is we've changed the labels on the arrows, like from OTRP to TEEP and, and so on. But the arrows, um, go all the way back for you know, a year or more to the first hackathons where Ming and I were doing the transport. Nothing, nothing has really changed since then, so as far as the, the shape of the arrows. So are you okay if I go on, Ming, to the next time? Yeah, 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 let's go on. Yeah. All right, great. Okay. Um, this one should be not controversial, but I want to go through this one before the next one that is uh, uh, slightly more technical. So this one, uh, in Tears Review, right, there was a discussion of threats on the mailing list, and so there was three or four threats that were discussed on the mailing list, and so uh, Ming did the uh, write-up and put these in the security consideration section. And so the top two are ones that are specifically really related to uh, DOS, Right. One is DOS by the rich execution environment, and the other one is DOS by the TEEP broker. Um, or in theory, it would be attempting to do attacks more than just DOS. Uh, and the security discussion talks about how the other attacks are mitigated and everything is reduced to DOS, but this uh, architecture does not prevent a DOS attack by a compromised REE or broker. That's roughly what the security consideration section does, is everything else is reduced to DOS. So Dave, and I'm sorry, I haven't read it. Is there anything that says um, there could be some attack prior to um, prior to the point that or injected where the attestation values are still met and the policy, you know, something's embedded um, early in the supply chain before signatures happen. I mean, that's where attacks are going to go once we have all this stuff. Is there any uh, warning along those lines? Not yet. So maybe something along those lines? Uh, that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say. It's um, just a warning, is, right? Like that's yeah, what uh, we're left with, and yeah. that's just reality. So I'm going to temporarily jump down to the bottom bullet on this slide because there is text that talks about how attestation can be used to detect malicious TAs. Uh, which is the relationship to, to rats, right? Because I think part of your point actually overlaps with the rats architecture document too. Uh, yeah, I'll have to go over current version. I'm sorry, I haven't done that yet. But yeah, essentially, I just want to make sure that we're not painting too rosy a picture that, I mean, I, I think it is a much, much better picture when all of this is done. But I mean, with nation state threat actors and what they accomplished today, that's what they will be doing, right? They're going to target the people um, responsible for these things or become one of the people responsible and alter something where it's sure. so early it can't be detected. No, I think some documents should definitely talk about that. I'm saying, I, I think that that same issue could come up on the RATS architecture. And so maybe uh, Hank and Michael and I should talk about that, uh, you know, tomorrow or whenever in our, okay. uh, in our uh, RATS architecture call. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Hank or Michael, do you have anything to add on that one? Uh, um, um, headphones. Um, 
Uh, I was going to say this, that what Kathleen's asking for, I agree, it maybe belongs in RAT, but in the team space, maybe it, maybe there needs to be a, an approachability that says which part this keep, this protects. And it could simply say this other stuff is, is still a problem. Yep. Okay, and maybe that's only three sentences in applicability somewhere. Um, so Kathleen, the closest, oh, sorry, uh, and Hank, did you have anything to add? As otherwise I'm going to jump down to the bottom, which is still on the same topic. So. Um, yeah, I don't think the text has to reflect that it's security conservation apparently. So yeah, it has to be a trust model specific, sorry, trust model specific text, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we can have a discussion on this, this tomorrow. I, I actually hope I can make it. I might have a conflict because I'm I'm face to face on the East Coast right now, and I, I might have a conflict meeting. I still don't know. I just arrived here. I'm a little bit uh, tired. Okay. Um, so Kathleen, issue number one twenty three at the bottom had to do with uh, what happens if you have a malicious TA, right? And there was two cases that were brought up. Um, one case was where. Um, there's a TA that's actually buggy and you didn't know about it before. And so suddenly a vulnerability was found. And so that TA is now sort of accidentally malicious or could be used for malicious purposes. Not that the developers were bad, just had bugs in it or something like that. The other case is where you had a good TA and maybe the uh, provider updated it legitimately in a way where it now turned bad, right? So uh, the and so that's close to a supply chain attack where, you know, the signer or the author gets uh, compromised or goes bad and generates a version of it that is actually more malicious. Okay. Or so. you thought you had a good one, but you didn't right from the beginning. Right, exactly. And so the point is, you now have a malicious TA, whether you did it before is irrelevant, but you got into a case, you have a malicious TA inside your TE, what happens? Okay. There's text that's on that. That was issued in 123. And what the discussion is right now is it has two things. It talks about how the TAM is responsible for uninstalling things. Um, and I saw maybe Nico, so, somebody commented as a GitHub issue like last night um, uh, with questions uh, further about this. So there may be additional text we may want to do here. But uh, the first one is that the TAM can uninstall the TA has gone bad. And uh, the question that was raised, uh, I think by Nico, was uh, so does that mean that TAs can continue you know, indefinitely, right? Because you can DOS the ability to talk to the TAM. And the answer is, well, yes. And so that's why the other bullet is there, which is if you have attestation, if you have malicious TAs, then the attestation will fail as long as the policy in the verifier is, you know, is uh, would treat the malicious TAs as not being um, valid. And so that means that yeah, your TA could be there, but your attestation will fail, and so your uh, your asks to do anything that needs to be attested will fail. So just one want to add one here that the removal may not be immediate. Uh, just that when that good TA goes bad, because uh, that uh, removal need to be initiated from device to contact TAM. So TAM may not be able to always reach a device, right? So that's always has some delay. And then that was always suggestion, more of a suggestion or implementation choice. They may have some device that you can scan periodically look at what has bad, there may be some blacklist or some report list that can proactively initiate that one, or in next contact time. But uh, but once TA start to use, it may not contact time for long, right? It may not have the need to do that. So that way, they need some additional uh, additional mechanism to uh, scan the list to check what whether all TA is still good. So that's the out of scope of this uh, protocol. Uh, definition, but for the security consideration, it's a recommendation. Additional scan or check may be needed. To my view uh, to is that the attestation does that, which is so. This comes back to you, and we want to talk about this in the RATS architecture. Is um, when you say hit a verifier and get an attestation result, how long is that attestation result then uh, good for? In other words, what's the reliance party going to do with that attestation result? Are they going to keep it and let you keep doing operations for the lifetime of a connection that could be hours or days? Or is it something that comes with some uh, lifetime that says your attestation says you're good uh, during this connection, but for no more than you know an hour or something like that. Because what happens if you go bad within the lifetime of that connection? What happens? Because if you go bad, then what happens is your attestation fails, and that then 
causes uh, 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 the request to fail, which then says, well, now's a good time to go back to the TAM because I'm going to have to get a new uh, attestation ticket and I can't until I'm remediated. Yeah, that will depend on additional service availability. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's a one way. It's a, it's a, and then a point, uh, it will be a little bit, a little bit delay there. It's not immediate. I'm thinking I should file an issue in the RATS architecture document to have some security consideration uh, discussion about how long an attestation result could be used for, uh, basically discussion of this issue. Yeah, this is saying if you file that issue, uh, there are multiple factors that impact the validity of evidence and corresponding attestation results. There will always be a delay yep. when you have the result that the evidence might have already changed, and this is an inherent loop problem, so we can highlight that there. Yeah, exactly. I think we don't have enough discussion in the security consideration section right now, and we could end the RATS architecture, and we could expand on that. But that's been true with operating system capabilities forever. Of course. This is not a, right? This isn't a new thing. Nope. There's tons of literature you can point to as opposed to writing something, is what I meant. Well, if you actually have a suggestion of something to point to, which has a good discussion, um, that would be great. Well, I wonder if um, the T um, document should instead request or articulate uh, what it believes a reasonable time should be, rather than rats trying to say what we can promise, teach should maybe say what it would require. Like, um, this is saying my recommendation would be to not put your exact times in. It is very specific to the. Well, it may not be uh, an exact uh, time. It may be. It could be. It could be. It must be. It must uh, last long enough for the following three steps or something. Could be indefinite. Yeah, that's a good question. I think I like the comment. Actually, as I was thinking about, uh, because the comment is thinking about who defined the policy, right? If they say how long, then who controls that? Uh, at time, TE, uh, agent, or who, right? I think maybe a little bit uh, thinking, follow up on that one. I'm thinking now, say who, who controls lifetime of TA? It may be time. I think to me the time initially you start, if you find some wrong, maybe it will set that time limit as a policy decision. Yeah. See, this will be not an attestation of who defined the policy. Even attestation server so check it still, they need some policy initiated. Okay. So I'm reporting that issue number 123 has some text about this, and uh, last night there's a new text, a new issue filed, and so it sounds like any of the further discussion we can do under the new issue that's not on my slides because I did the slides. Yeah, let's add, uh, yeah, I was, yeah, I would like you know, make an okay. issue about this, uh, this uh, kind of remove delay policy. I'd say how how long, how soon? No. I still have it on my screen here. Uh, no, okay. All right, so it sounds like, uh, I, I don't know if I heard that Ming, you were volunteering to uh, work on that issue? Ming, the new one? No, no I'll follow up that all. I, all right, great, because there is one in, in GitHub if you look there and we can just assign that one to you. I don't know what the number is, but it's there in GitHub. Okay. No. okay, so I skipped over issue number 120 because Kathleen was asking questions that were very relevant to 123, so. Uh, so 120 was, um, a type of DOS where the top two is about, you know, DOSing different actions on the device. This one is about um, uh, a, an additional point that says, okay, well, if I keep asking to uninstall or install a TA, so I'd like, I'm trying to install an untrusted application and uninstall the untrusted application, one or the other, that depends on a particular TA. So let's say I say, hey, I want to, ins I want to install this untrusted app and it depends on this TA. And you don't have permission to install that TA. You know, the TAM says, nope, that one's not authorized. That one's a malicious one or whatever. And so you could say, well, I still want to install it. 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 And what happens then, according to the current text, is you would keep bothering the TAM that says, hey, TAM, I got a request for this TA. Can I install it now? And the TAM would say, no. Well, can I install it now? No. Can I install it now? No. And so on. 
So we had a text uh, in the security consideration that says, you know, a TIP agent might want to limit the repeated request to avoid bothering the TAM, you know, to, to avoid you know, a DOS attack against the TAM. And so we added that into the consider security consideration section. Um, did Hannes approve that text? Hannes did not comment on that one. Because it is uh, require state. And as, as if, I, if I know Hannes correctly, uh, he tries to avoid any kind of state. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, this I one is not a, so. this one is not a must. It's an implementer's consideration. Ah, okay, thanks. And so, if you're doing an MCU, then sure, then you might be bothering the TAM a bunch if you choose not to do that, right? But it's something that you need to consider, and so it's good to call it out. Fine. Okay, I'm going to move on unless there's any other comments on this one here. It's been a great discussion. Um. Actually, it is now 7.55. Dave, I'm just giving you a time check. Yeah. You, you have five minutes left. Okay, do you want me to stop now, or do you want me to take the other five minutes? No, take up the five minutes. Okay, Because isn't here, so, okay. yeah. Um, so the next one, uh, uh, also Tira raised in his review, uh, clarify the code signing certificate type. And so uh, this is discussion of things like self-sign and CA-issued certs, right? And so when doing cert validation, the cert validation just says, hey, does the following cert chain up to something in the trust anchor store, right? Well, the thing in the trust anchor store could be the cert itself. And so it, it might not be a signing cert. It might be the cert itself. And so in that sense that uh, certs are legal no matter how many levels up they are in the, in the cert chain. And so uh, you could use a self-signed cert. It could be a CA issued cert. It's just whether you have to traverse zero or more levels up the cert chain before you find a match in the trust anchor store. And so we tried to clarify that, that that text as opposed to things that we're saying, you know, it must be self-signed or, or it must be, you know, some CA issued thing because uh, it the trust anchor store is agnostic as to, you know, where you got it from. Um, but the, the this generated description, and I think this led over onto the list, not just GitHub, but uh, is the code signature checked at the TAM. Um, and so there was a discussion between on the list between Tiru and Ming and me, and I forget who else. It says, uh, does the TAM need to verify the TA signature on binaries submitted to the TAM? And Ming gave a great answer uh, on that, which is two considerations. Well, you know, the TA might not be distributed via the TAM to begin with, and so it can't check a signature on something it doesn't have, right? But if it does have it, then the TA might be encrypted. And so what does the TAM do with something that's encrypted? Um, I then added that the TAM can just authenticate the entity because really the ability to upload binaries to the TAM is largely out of scope. It just says that that has to happen, but the details for doing that, there's no protocol or whatever for the protocol within the scope of the working group is between the TAM and the device, not between the developer and the TAM. You just got to have some way to do it. Um, and so it points out that the TAM could just authenticate the entity uploading the TA and not uh, check the signature on the TA, just make sure it comes from a valid source. And so, uh, but mechanisms to do so are out of scope. And that point is not currently discussed in the document. And the question is, should it be? Right now, the only statement on this topic in the document is, is the responsibility of the TAM to not install malicious trusted apps in the first place? It doesn't say how it might actually accomplish that. Actually, that's, that's what I was thinking about right on, because we, uh, when we wrote that uh, security consideration, you know, we assume it's a time distributed. So now we have two ways to distribute TA, right? TA binary can be bundled inside the untrusted app itself. Uh, in that case, when you install, how do we know it's malicious or not? So there was be assumed trust there. When that, yeah. The next question <laughs> is, do we think that the longer discussion is out of scope of the architecture document or that adding a discussion of this issue to the architecture document, like security considerations or whatever, would be good? I don't think adding it would hurt, so that would be my suggestion. Yeah, I, I think you need to discuss this. I, I feel, I feel may need it. Okay. So uh, your second bullet, second bullet, first one. The TM, if it is distributed from on trust app itself, you know, kernel light. I was, I need some statement there. It needs somewhere to be checked. 
but had a TA TPA agent know this was a good one. Uh, they might some way need to check. So in the interest of time, I think what I'm hearing so far is that yes, it would be good to discuss this in the document without necessarily specifying mechanisms, but then discussing the issues would be good. Yeah. So we should do that in 07 is what I'm hearing. I think that was the last question in my deck that was, uh, uh, do we think there's any gaps? Hey, hey, editors, we don't know. You know hey, working group, the editors need some direction on what to do. I think everything else is just us reporting out what to do. So I think this slide is a good time to stop. So, Kathleen, That's I'm going great. to ask you to wrap us up and anything else that was on the. Yeah. So, so how many more issues? Because I, I have seen Tiro close a bunch of them. Yeah. How many of them do you think are remaining open? Um, that one. So if we look here, um, the, this one we said was, so these are the, the requirements on personalization data. We talked about that one, so that's easy yeah. to address now. Uh, this is the one that Dave Wheeler is going to do on the list. I think that one was already done yeah. and can be closed. These are the two that were just filed only a couple hours ago. So the malicious TA removal is the one that we were just talking about um, and cracking the new stuff there. And this one I haven't read yet. And so this is how many that's left, but we're really close. And so I'd say all these, okay. other, than, other than this one, these would be possible to do very soon and do a, a new rev and then start a working group last call and still finish before our next ITF. That would be great. So let us know, let us, the chairs know when you can issue the next draft. And we we can go ahead and issue another working group last call. Yeah, you see the ID kind of efficient until March 9th. And so we have like a whole month, but I hopefully we won't need that now. But. Well, that's why I say, let us know. <laughs> and we can work towards that. Well, great. This is good progress. And then, um, Ming, since Hannes isn't here, it'd be good to know um, what the plans and, and updates are for the TEEP protocol draft. And Dave, I think you're an editor too, just so that we keep that in mind for the for the actual face to face. Yes, I think we'll make a, we'll have a, a you know not many issues, but we'll update. I think we'll have a, some update before the next meeting. Well, unless there's anything else, and, and actually we're out of time. So um, we'll keep the conversation over email, and we'll see you guys in Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye-bye.